It's good to be back with you tonight. I want to invite you to open with me to Genesis chapter 1. As uh, you're turning there, I'm going to share with you a story, a story that has been cleared to share by our pastor. So as some of you had mentioned to me over the last week, they're like, man, I hadn't seen you in a while. Well, we had been to Alabama for two weeks. So we rolled back into town last weekend, and I come in bouncing and bounding like a man that had been on vacation, walk into our pastor's office. Pastor, it's great to see you. It's good to see you too. Now that you're back on the clock, can you preach next Sunday night? Not that it's Sportsman's Banquet Week or... We're leaving on a discovery trip tomorrow. None of that mattered. No, he's, he had a busy week too. We all had a busy week, but he said, hey, listen, you did this, this study back in August uh, on uh, Wednesday morning, Wednesday night Bible study. Why don't you bring that Sunday night? And so back by popular demand by at least one, we're going to come back to something actually taught on about a month or so ago in, in Wednesday, or during our Wednesday services. So if you were in that, man, you, maybe you ought to be up here and, and maybe uh, have a little more to add than what I do tonight. Uh, but prayerfully, even if you were in that, the Lord will continue to speak and reveal truth to you tonight. Uh, I've entitled this, God's Blessing and Purpose. And I think this is something we all can relate to. Uh, we all enjoy God's blessing. I want you to think from the outset, we'll come back to this a little bit later, why? Why does God bless us? Why does, not just us, but why does God bless his people? All throughout scripture, why does God bless them? Is it just to bless them? Is it just for them to go, hey, look, look at what God did for me? Or is there something more to God's purpose and intent when he blesses his people. And that's what we're going to look at tonight. And so as we begin to look at Scripture, there's 66 books in the Bible. Cover a long time, cover several hundred years from Genesis to the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, the institution and constitution of the church, the spread of the gospel throughout the first century. All that's recorded by some 35 to 40 authors. And yet what is very distinct and unique about God's Word is 66 distinct books and letters by some 40 different authors, yet it is one unified, cohesive story. You don't find that anywhere else. And so when you look at the Bible as a whole, what you begin to see really is you can divide it in three parts, just like you can a lot of other books. So you have an introduction. Genesis chapter 1 through 11 is your introduction to God's story. If you don't understand what goes on in the first 11 chapters of the Bible, you're not really going to understand the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey might say. So Genesis 1 through 11 is your introduction to a great dilemma. A great, holy, creative God that has blessed his creation and man's rebellion against that God. Now we've got the dilemma. From Genesis 12 through Jude is how God responds to that dilemma. That's your main body. And then Revelation, that's the conclusion. By the way, we win. And so when you start looking at Scripture, it's like any other great piece of literature, except this is inspired by God, carries authority with it. But there's something very important for us as we go into God's Word that we need to know and understand. Even if you were opening Shakespeare, it's important to understand theme or themes that the author is communicating through that word to better understand the flow of that story. The Bible is no different. And the better that you understand the themes of the Bible, the better you will understand and interpret what God is speaking to us. And very early on, from Genesis chapter 1, 
a theme begins to emerge. In fact, there's a couple, but we don't have time to deal with multiple themes tonight. We're just going to look at two. And I want you to look with me in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28. It says, And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So right off the bat, as God has created, it tells us that God desires to bless his creation. The pinnacle of that creation is us. God desires to bless not only creation, but ultimately he desires to bless man and woman. Now I want you to move a little bit further over to Genesis chapter 9, and I want you to see if you notice something that is being repeated. Genesis chapter 9 verse 1, we've moved on into the introduction of God's story. And it says, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So in Genesis 1 and Genesis chapter 9, we're introduced to two pretty important themes. God's desire to bless creation, to specifically bless his people. But we're also introduced to the theme of responsibility. Did you notice in both of those verses, be fruitful, be multi- to multiply, to fill the earth. So God has given man responsibility within his blessing. Now it's going to be more clearly defined as we get into Genesis 12 in just a few moments. And so I want to invite you to go ahead and turn over there. But we left a lot of story out in that introduction. I hit one verse in creation and one verse with Noah to illustrate those two main themes that are introduced very early in this introduction. But if you automatically jump to Genesis chapter 12 to this calling of Abraham and God's covenant with him and how that unfolds, if if you miss the introduction, you don't understand the significance of what starts in Genesis chapter 12. Now, obviously, we don't have time to read 11 chapters tonight. So I'm going to give you a summary of 11 chapters in Genesis. So are you ready? There will be a quiz at the end. Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created everything from the smallest atom to the greatest galaxy and everything in between. He created the sun, the moon, the stars. He knows what's going on from the recesses of the Marianas Trench all the way to the heights of Mount Everest. He created it all and is in control of it all. And ultimately, he created man and woman. And he created man and woman to have relationship with him. And as God brought man and woman into the Garden of Eden, into that perfect place, he said, you can have all the freedom in the world with one restriction. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And yet, what does Adam and Eve do? They listen to the serpent. The serpent comes along and said, Did God really say not to eat of this fruit? They did. And the result of that rebellion against God was broken fellowship with him. And so as they have rebelled and sinned against God, God meets them in the garden And we find ourselves in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 to 16, actually being introduced to some good news right off the bat. In the midst of brokenness, God says, I'm going to do something. I'm going to bring someone one day, serpent. Yes, you're going to bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. And so we're introduced that this, this story is going somewhere from the very beginning. And in the midst of that, we also see not only God bringing justice but we also see God being merciful because God actually sacrifices an animal because of their sin and that shows us right off the bat that without the shedding of blood there is no covering for sin and so as a consequence God ushers them out of the garden of Eden now they're going to have to work a lot harder than they were originally created to do But they continue to have children, and their children have children, and they continue to multiply. But as they multiply, the rebellion would continue. Man doesn't tend to 
walk in righteousness, he tends to go towards sin. And that's what we see continue to unfold throughout the story in these first couple of chapters of, Re- of Genesis. In fact, man would become so sinful that it grieved God's heart that he created man. And so God was going to bring judgment upon the earth through a global flood. But yet within God's judgment, we also see God's mercy. Because as God has pronounced judgment upon the earth, he says, I'm going to protect this one man, Noah, and his family, and calls Noah to build this ark and places Noah and his family, and animals, two of each kind, upon this boat, and God brings judgment upon the earth and essentially wipes out humanity as a result of their sin. The land dries. God brings Noah and his family out of the boat, and they continue to multiply. Their children have children, and Despite God's faithfulness and mercy to Noah, sin is going to continue to abound and they would ultimately reject God's authority themselves. And as man continues to multiply and sinful man does what sinful man does, we find ourselves in an ancient Near Eastern town called Shinar. And as the people are gathered there in Shinar, they decide they're going to build this great city, but within this great city, they're going to build a great tower. They're going to build a name for themselves, and this tower is going to reach the heavens. But part of what was going on with this tower is they were trying to keep everybody there. They were trying to keep everyone from dispersing, which in itself was a violation to what God had told them. Remember, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And yet the people were still staying there, being disobedient to God. And so what does God do? With catastrophic judgment, he confuses their language and disperses the people all over the earth. And when we get to Genesis chapter 10 and 11, if you go through, my math may be a little bit off, but there's approximately 70 different peoples that are dispersed. Their their language had been confused. That's your introduction. There's a pattern. That pattern is sin. That pattern is rebellion towards God. And it is out of this context, those first 11 chapters of man spurning God, that we come to Genesis chapter 12 and we're introduced to this man named Abram that God is going to call from his country, out of his country. In fact, I want you to look with me in Genesis chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land, that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, as we read through there, there's three ways that God said he was going to bless Abram. He says, I'm going to make you a great nation. He says, I'm going to make you a great name, or I'm going to give you a great name, which that was a big deal in the ancient Near East. But he also said that he would be a blessing to all the families of the earth. Now, as you look back on verses 2 and 3, I want you to think about something. What does it tell us about God's purpose in this covenant that he's bringing to Abram? Well, it tells us that Abram's blessing was to serve as a blessing to others. This is not just about Abram. Abram's not just God's pretty little pet that he's sitting over there just lavishing gifts on him. That's not how this thing works. No, it's about all the families of the earth. I want you to go to the last phrase in verse 2. Did you recognize there's a so that? 
He says, I'll make you a great nation. I will bless you, make your name great, so that, this is purpose, this is why, you will be a blessing. Look at the end of verse 3. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Well, what preceded that? He said, I'll bless those who bless you. I'll, and him who dishonors you, I'll curse. And what? In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So as you look at those two statements, they give us some clarity on why God chose to bless Abraham. And it gives further definition to that, that theme of God's blessing and responsibility. So why did God choose to bless Abram? Simply to bless all peoples. You can't make it sound any fancier than what it is. God's blessing upon Abram had much to do about God and God's desire to do things among the peoples of the world. So was this just about Israel? No. Because when we get to the Old Testament, what do we focus on? Israel. And rightfully so, because that's kind of what the story's about. But was it just about God forming the nation of Israel? If it was, why is it going to be a blessing to all peoples? Right from the beginning, this is much bigger than the nation of Israel. Now, if we're honest... When we get to Genesis chapter 10, Genesis chapter 11, Matthew chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, those are genealogies. By show of hands, how many of you love a genealogy? Said no one ever. I mean, if we're honest, we hit the genealogy and we go, woo. We kind of gloss over those. Why? They're just not exciting to read. Jim begat Sue, begat Bill. But if the names were only that simple, right? But what we have to remember is they're there for a reason. It is God's word at the end of the day. So God is intentional with everything. He's not like, oh, I'm just going to throw these in there and see if they're faithful enough to read them. No, there's a reason that those genealogies are there. Regardless of whether it's in Matthew, and Matthew is showing the Jewish reader that this Messiah, yes, he is the true Messiah through that genealogy. There's always purpose behind that genealogy. And when we get to Genesis chapter 12, we can't forget the genealogies that are listed in Genesis chapter 10 and chapter 11. Why is that important? Because think of that theme or one of those themes that unfolds for us in those first 11 chapters. It's dysfunction. It's sin. It's brokenness. It's bad. And so right off the heels of judgment connected with the Tower of Babel, we're introduced to Genesis chapter 12. Does it make sense now? Judgment, sin, brokenness, there's a great problem. There's been a flood. God has judged the world, and yet what continues to happen? Sin is rampant. There is a problem that needs a solution. Genealogy, genealogy. Oh, here's a story about a dude from Ur. That's where we're introduced to Abram. So there's a reason for those genealogies because God is showing us that now I'm going to bring something about that's going to be a solution to the problems that have unfolded at the very beginning of this story. Now we're going to jump way ahead in the story. I want you to jump with me all the way over to the New Testament in Galatians chapter 3. You're like, how in the world are you going from Genesis 12 to Galatians 3? I'm glad you asked that. Because when you get to Gen Galatians chapter 3, Paul does something really unique. And you also have to remember something that Paul is addressing in Galatians. Galatians. 
when he writes to the church in Galatia, basically Judaizers have come in and they're trying to put the law back on those believers. And so when you get to Galatians 3, specifically down to verse 7, Paul begins saying, Know then, that is, those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Paul is explaining Genesis chapter 12 all the way in Galatians chapter 3. So this actually helps us better understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let me ask you this. Did the law exist when God called Abram in Genesis chapter 12? The answer is no. After Abraham responded to God's call in Genesis chapter 12, did he give him the law then? No. Had the nation of Israel been established yet? Nope. Was Abram an Israelite? Or was he a pagan? He's a pagan. He's from Ur. Israel didn't exist yet. Now think about this. The law would not come about for about 430 years after Abram or Abraham would die. I want you to go all the way back with me now. Remember what Paul said. In fact, keep a finger in Galatians chapter 3 because we're going to jump all the way back to Genesis 15. I promise you this is all connected. Because as Abram has responded to God and has walked with the Lord and some days were better than others, he still doesn't have a child. And he's supposed to have this great name. He's supposed to be a great nation. He's supposed to be a blessing to all the peoples of the world. And he's not getting any younger. That's where we find Genesis chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. It says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. Pause there. I mean, Abram's saying probably what every one of us would say. God, you said you were going to do this. I'm getting to be old. It's not like children generally are born to people in their 70s or 80s, Right? God, what are you doing? You said you were going to do this, but I don't, I don't have anyone. I don't have anything. In fact, right now, one of my servants is my heir. Go back to verse 4. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Verse 6. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Remember, this is a pagan dude. Dude from Ur. God said, go to a land that I'm going to show you. He ups and he goes, and he's been following the Lord the best he can. Still hadn't received that promise. and God takes him out as we just read and says, I want you to count what you see. If you can, I dare you. And Abram's response was what? Okay, Lord, you said it. I believe you. Why is that important? Because God justified this pagan guy in the Old Testament by faith and not works.
You see, we think gospel, we jump to the New Testament, right? And understandably so. It's the fulfillment of the good news of Jesus Christ. But here in Galatians chapter 3, this is where I want you to go back. Hopefully you kept your finger there. Back in Galatians chapter 3, did you catch what Paul said in verse 8? And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to who? Abraham. God's preaching the gospel in Genesis, not just Matthew, Mark, Luke, John to Revelation. In Genesis, coming out of sin, coming out of brokenness, coming out of dysfunction, God says, I've got a solution to this. And he preached this to Abram from the beginning. So if the gospel is good news, what would the good news have been to Abram? That faith leads to righteousness, and it is not for one specific person. That faith would lead to righteousness, and it wasn't just for the Jew. It wasn't just for Israel. It was for all the peoples of the world. Now, where in the world are you going with all this, Falgu? I'm glad you thought about it. Because I want you to take everything that we have just talked about from that introduction of sin and brokenness, God calling Abram out, Abraham believing the Lord and it being credited to him as righteousness, that Paul is, is giving clarification from Galatian to what was going on in Genesis chapter 12. And I want you to come back to that theme of God blessing and man's responsibility within that. And I want you to think, how has the Lord blessed you? How has God blessed you individually? How has God blessed you as a family? And before we really get into material blessing, because that's generally what we tend to, to think about, I want you to come back to some other aspects of blessing. I want you to specifically think about where you were born, where you live, where you reside. Why were you born where you were born and you weren't born in North Korea? Why were you born here and not born in Afghanistan or Iran or Turkmenistan? Why were you born here just so you could wave a flag and beat your chest and say, I'm proud to be an American? Is that why you were born here? Is that why you were born in a, a, a country that has unprecedented freedom? The world has never seen freedom like we have freedom. So why were you born here? Why were you born with the opportunities that you have had for an education, for a job, for a career? Was it just to earn money? Was it just to retire one day and collect seashells? You have to answer that question. I'm just posing it. You have the opportunity to do what we're doing tonight? To freely gather and worship? Nobody's going to run through that door and arrest me or Pastor Brian or Petro or Brandon or Richard or anyone else that stands on this pulpit, you can go stand on Main Street if you want in a loincloth eating wild locust and honey preaching, thus saith the Lord God. And you might get carried off in a straitjacket because people think you're crazy, but you're not getting arrested. Why were you born here? Why do you have all of this? Why do you have all the access to all the Christian materials that you and I have access to? Which, by the way, not all of it's good. We take it for granted that we can queue up the laptop, the iPad, our phone, and we can access Christian websites anytime we want to. We can turn on Christian radio anytime we want to. We can go to a Christian bookstore anytime we want to. It's not that way in about two-thirds of the world. Not to mention your home, your transportation, your 
various levels of health. Some of us are more healthy than others, but you're still here. Why? Why? So as you think about that, I want to ask another question. What is your responsibility with God's blessing? Is it just yours? Is it just your pet blessing? So you can hold it. You can pet it. You can rock it. You can show up to a life group and go, man, look what God did. And then take it back and love on it. I want you to go back to Abram. What was God's purpose in blessing him? To bless the world. So what is the purpose of God's blessing in your life? What is the purpose that you were convicted of sin and unrighteousness? that you had an opportunity to hear and respond to the gospel, to be a part of a faith family. Why? You see, the gospel came to you because it was going somewhere else. God blessed you so that you could be a blessing to others to magnify His name and advance His kingdom. Go with me to Psalm 67. you to read and really listen to what the psalmist is saying here. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God, let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Why should we want the blessing of God? so we can magnify and glorify the name of Jesus Christ all across the world, that people see how truly great and magnificent He is, and they want that too. If you weren't born here by mistake, you don't have the opportunity that you have by mistake. You don't have the career and the friends that you have by mistake. So the question that we have to ask is how are we utilizing and stewarding God's blessing in your life and in the life of your family and in the life of the faith family? That's what I want to leave you with tonight. Because, man, God's blessing is awesome. And God's blessing on this church has been awesome. But as soon as we start hoarding that, it's gone. Maybe some of you are wondering, well, why hasn't God blessed me like he's blessed somebody else? First of all, I can't answer that. But my first question is, is what do you do with the blessings God does give you? Are you hoarding it? Or are you leveraging it for his glory and his purpose? Maybe tonight you just need to come to the altar and say, Lord, I've been selfish. I've been hoarding your blessing on my life, whatever that blessing is. Maybe it's my faith. I've been keeping that to me. I'm kind of haunted by some words I've heard several different times over the years and in different contexts where people of different nations ask this question to Christians. If the news was so great, why did it take so long to get here? That may be your neighbor, or it may be somebody in Poland, or South Asia, or Bolivia, or Mexico. But you won't know until you begin to open the hand, open the heart, 
and just let God continue to pour on you in order to pour out of you. 